seated. As you're seated, if you would turn with me in your copy of God's Word to the book of Ezra, the book of Ezra chapter 3, and if you're using one of the hardback Bibles in the seat in front of you, the black hardback, you'll find Ezra 3 on page 459. 459. I'd like us to look again at this book that we looked at a few years back. I don't remember exactly when. It was before the vid. And uh, we want to look again at this special portion on worship here in Ezra 3 verses 1 to 6. It is written for us in Ezra chapter 3 beginning in verse 1. When the seventh month came and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. Then arose Jeshua, the son of Josadak, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, with his kinsmen. And they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar in its place, for fear was on them because of the people of the lands. And they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. And they kept the Feast of Booths as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the rule as each day required. And after that, the regular burnt offerings, the offerings at the new moon and all, at all the appointed feasts of the Lord, and the offerings of everyone who made a freewill offering to the Lord." From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray for the illumination of the Spirit as we go to his word and come to the table this evening. Our Father, we thank you for all that was written for our instruction, that by your scriptures we might have hope and confidence in your Son, of whom all that is written in the law and David and the prophets is given for our instruction and fulfilling all your purposes in him. Help us, our Father, to behold the face of your Son and the hope of the gospel foretold beforehand, even in the history of your people Israel. We pray that you would minister your grace by your Spirit, helping the one who expounds your word and illuminating all who hear that we might behold your glory in the face of Jesus from even this portion of your word. And we pray this, our Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. The late historian Daniel Borstein called them pseudo-events. And by pseudo-event, Borstein meant an insignificant occurrence that gets an audience only because of modern media. He said this in 1962 in his book, The Image, where Borstein also coined the phrase that I'm sure you've heard, famous for being famous. He invented that in 1962. Our society got a pseudo-event last week, this time at the Oscars. Now, by all objective standards, the Oscars are asinine. It is a show where rich actors congratulate other rich actors for acting. And then they give speeches telling everyone who's not a rich actor how to live. And their only qualification for doing so is they're good at pretending to be someone they're not. The whole thing is bizarre. And last week, one actor hit a comedian for jokes that got out of hand. Borstein was right. It's a pseudo-event that has almost zero significance for anyone that wasn't directly involved. And yet it's safe to say that more professing Christians in our nation likely watched and spent time meditating on that pseudo-event than attending and meditating on the means of grace in worship and certainly in the evening. And we wonder why so many of God's professing people are so often filled with fear. We see here in this portion of God's Word in verse 3 that fear was on the people of God. That was their predominant concern of the recently returned exiles at this point in Israel's history. Remember here in Ezra, in chapters 1 to 2, Cyrus had already released Israel from exile that they were under by the judgment of God. They are now subjects of the Persian Empire, having originally been exiled by the Babylonians several decades beforehand. But they are now back in the land, but they are, as we see here so clearly, afraid. 
They're afraid because, verse 3, the peoples of the lands, the peoples, remember, who have spent the last 70-odd years taking it over for themselves, are not too happy to see these people return. And basically, they have in their minds invading immigrants in their own territory. Israel is back in God's land, but they're back as a minority in a strange and a dangerous and an overwhelming scenario. So they're afraid. What is the first course of action that they should take? What would you do? Maybe form a military alliance. Maybe appeal for government intervention. And those things are going to come, as you remember the narrative of this book. But first, here in this passage in verse 3, they set the altar of God in its place. And they worshipped morning and evening. They sought God. They sought God in His appointed way in the Old Covenant, both morning and evening, and they sought God because they were afraid. They worshipped because of their fear. They worshipped to sustain their faith in a scary world. Are you ever afraid? What can strengthen you? Here in this portion of God's Word, the Holy Spirit reminds us that by the means of grace and the worship of God, both morning and evening, God gifts His people with courage in chaotic times. I want us to ask just a simple question from these few verses. What do we receive in worship? And the answers we see here, we'll split the text at verse 3, is grace in saving promises, And then in verses 4 to 6, grace by scriptural worship. Grace in saving promises and grace by scriptural worship. Let's look first at grace in saving promises. We have here, we're told in verse 1, the seventh month had come. That in the Hebrew calendar is Tishri, that's our autumn, somewhere in September and October for us. And it is for Israel one of the most sacred months on the calendar. And the book of Leviticus outlines the schedule for us, and we have hints of it here. On the first day, we see here in verse 6, the first day of the seventh month is a day of rest. And Leviticus tells us there was actually a blast of trumpets to announce it, because these preceded the day of atonement. You remember the center of the center of God's law is that great day when the high priest confesses all the sins of all of Israel, and it's borne away by the goat. And that is happening on the 10th day that's assumed by verse 3 here. And then we have in verse 4 the Feast of Booths, which was a week-long ordinance or festival where Israel gathered in Jerusalem as we told they were in verse 1. Now consider all the excuses that could have been made by Israel. They are just recently in the land for a few months. There are still boxes in the garage. They had left their towns to go to Jerusalem. There are no gated communities. There are no security guards on their places. They leave it all to go to Jerusalem. They had no established police. The authorities were against them. They were suffering ethnic discrimination and religious persecution. They're an immigrant population. There are no walls in Jerusalem. They don't even, we're told in verse 6, have a temple yet. Now certainly, we would understand if someone had said, you know what, we're providentially hindered from worship. We just can't, this is, can't be possible. Certainly we would say there's good reasons to skip worship here. It's a bit too inconvenient. But we see here, they built the altar of the God of Israel in verse 2 to offer burnt alterings. Now remember, this altar is the way to the presence of God. It's how it's opened. The sacrifices on that altar were deaths suffered in the place of sinners by the substitutes that God appointed so that sinners could enter the presence of God without dying in judgment. Being afraid does not qualify you to enter the presence of God. You can be scared, you can be scarred, you can be sorry. And none of them deal with the fact of your sin. None of those. 
our failure in thought, word, and deed to personally, perpetually, and perfectly obey the law of God cannot just be waved away by our feelings. God cannot just overlook it. There must be a satisfaction of justice. There must be sacrifice. There must be a satisfaction of God's moral justice either on us or for us. And that's what happens at the altar. A substitute appointed for His people. For us to come to God. For God's people to be with Him and He with them. And that's what the offerings intended. We have a a great description in Leviticus 1 verse 4 that the priest would lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering and it should be accepted for him to make atonement for him. And again, this was their response in verse 3 to fear. The altar was set, we're told, for fear was on them. Now let's consider what was likely going on here and some more specific backdrop to this fear. Decades before, the Babylonians had left the poor in the land and had resettled other peoples. That's the peoples of the land that are referred to in verse 3. And though the Babylonians had torn down the altar of the temple, another altar would have been erected. We know this because in chapter 4, verse 2, they say, we have been sacrificing to God. So they have been putting their own sacrifices but on a pagan altar, likely with dressed stones, not according to the law of Moses, not according to the altar that God appointed. So the people of the land had their own altar, and they had a syncretistic pagan blend of religion with God's truth, which is to say they have none at all. They have abandoned the true God. So you have here, in the place of God's temple, a defiled pagan altar that's unacceptable for worship, and this immigrant people with no defenses is going to tear it down and take it apart and put in its place the true altar. Literally, the Hebrew here is upon its stand that is back where it belongs, its original base. And just think about this. People that have been living there for decades are watching immigrants tear down their tradition, their religion, their assumptions, and these new people claim they alone know the true way to the true God. Beloved, don't ever think we are the first generation of God's people to offend and practice what is scandalous to an easily angered world. That precedes even the New Testament. And we know it can be, it's scary. People are offended. And the term here, even for fear, in verse 3, is not the ordinary Hebrew term. You could translate this as terror. God's people are terrified. They're by themselves. And they're there inciting the outrage of, at that time, were the locals. And so the conjunction here in verse 3 is causal. That is, they set the altar in its place because, or for, fear was on them. It's because they were afraid that they worshipped. That is the most first and basic step in scary times. The first thing to do in a time of fear is to trust the God who is sovereign over all of it and to have confidence to know that He is for you and on your side in the midst of it. That is the result, beloved, of the gospel. All the sacrifices we know that were set here by God's people were all pointing to one final sacrifice. The Lord Jesus Christ on the cross outside this very city hundreds of years later. Whom God, as Paul will say in Romans 3.25, put forward Jesus as a propitiation by his blood. That is to satisfy God's justice in his own death. And it's received by faith. That is the resounding testimony then in the book of Romans by the Apostle Paul. And in chapter 4, he discusses how we are declared right. We talked about that last week, if you remember. We're declared righteous by Christ's active obedience as he receives on our behalf God's justice, his passive obedience. And so when we come to chapter 5 in the book of Romans, Paul outlines in five short verses four results of justification. 
The first, in verse 1, since we have justified by, we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You have peace. That is to say that the warfare between us and God has ended because he has reconciled us to himself. Not that we brought peace, but he accomplished it. The second thing Paul says in Romans 5 verse 2 is we have also obtained access. We have access to God. We can come to God in the name of Christ. And we can pray, and we can cry, and we can come to him, and we can know that the Lord sees, the Lord knows, the Lord hears, and the Lord remembers his covenant with us in Jesus Christ. We have access. The third fruit of justification in Romans 5 verse 2 is we rejoice in hope. That is to say, if we have access with God in Christ now, then we have the hope that we will be with him forever. Again, we considered that last week, didn't we? We said to be justified means that condemnation would be unjust, so that there's nothing to fear for all who are in Christ. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, so we have hope of dwelling with God forever, whatever the outcome of our immediate circumstance. But the fourth fruit of justification is somewhat surprising. Finally, Paul says in Romans 5.3, we rejoice in our sufferings. Now, how does that follow? Well, Paul says, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. That is, the the math and the logic that Paul's outlining in Romans 5 is this. If God is for us, if we have peace with him, if we have access to him, if we have hope to be with him forever, then that must mean the sovereign over our circumstances, the one who has actually ordained it, even over our sufferings, he must not mean evil by them. He must mean good. They must not be punitive. They must be formative to move into character, endurance, and into hope. Christ has taken our punishment. Therefore, any suffering we endure must be productive, not punitive. It must be for our good. You see, the worship of God, the declaration and the repetition of his saving promises, of having secured a way to him to be his people, is our first recourse in fearful times. It's our first because if God can is for us, then who could be against us? And there is grace that comes to his people by his saving promises. And so the first thing God's people secure is the way and confidence before God by sacrifice. A few years ago, a Laotian pastor in Laos gave this message to an American missionary embassy who, embassy who visited him. And he said this, Please pray for my country, Laos. I know how hard life is. But I want to encourage Christians in America to be strong in their faith. And they went on to say this. You have the right to read the Bible, to pray, and to go to church. Please do that. What a great encouragement. How discouraging it is to know it was necessary. What a discouragement that our flippancy towards corporate worship in general as American Christians, is known worldwide by our brothers in the church around the world. As Christians around the world endure far more suffering just to attend services. And we regularly excuse our absence because Saturday's too busy, and of course you know Monday's always coming. We ought never wonder, beloved, why the church around the world can endure so much and we seem to collapse in such relatively minor trials because we have decided to keep the promises of God away from us and far from our minds, the only source of our hope. It is not, beloved, insignificant that as attendance on corporate worship falls, prescription for anti-anxiety medications rises. Now please hear me. I am not at all saying that those medications are always bad or even unnecessary, not at all. But in general, consider the trends. It is quantifiable. We as a people worship less and we're fearful more. And I would suggest to you on the authority of the word of God 
those two phenomena are not unrelated. They're absolutely connected. The Puritan David Clarkson, who actually succeeded John Owen once, in fact, preached a sermon titled, Why Public Worship is to be Preferred Over Private. Now, we don't have to choose between private and public worship, of course, but Clarkson said, if you did, hypothetically, you choose public. Why? Because that is how Christ ordinarily strengthens us in faith, by what we call the ordinary means of grace. We read this in our confession in chapter 14, paragraph 1, in part, the grace of faith is the work of the Spirit of Christ in their hearts and is ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the Word. And we see it again in question 95 of the Baptist Catechism, which asks this, what are the outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption? How do we get His grace, we who are redeemed? The answer The outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption are his ordinances, especially the word, baptism, the Lord's Supper, and prayer, all of which are made effectual to the elect for salvation. Now this comes, beloved, right out of the New Testament in passages like the Lord Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17, 17, sanctify them in your truth, the word is, your word is truth. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. Faith is both born and it is nurtured by hearing the gospel of Jesus from Scripture. Or even James 1, 18, of God's own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And there's many other texts. It is by God's word that he works in us, both to birth faith and to increase it and to sustain it. And this is why our worship is all about the word and hearing it. As it is read and preached and prayed and sung and shown in the waters of baptism and the elements of this table, which as we are reminded every time we do it, is to proclaim. It's a visible word. It's a message to our hearts of God's grace. And we need to hear the word of truth, the gospel of Christ, daily and twice on Sundays. Because we don't just fail to remember it, we are fighting against remaining sin. The sin that tempts us to doubt the gospel and to think it is an illusion. We also have an adversary who prowls like a roaring lion who wants to devour us and to tempt us. And we have a world, the world that doesn't understand him or they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And so we need a word that is literally otherworldly to break into our battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. That word that is sung and that is preached and that is read over us and comes from outside of us by others. It is in corporate worship that the objected promises of God's Word meet the subjective and shifting faith of our hearts. And it confronts us and corrects us and comforts us. And if this is true, if the Lord births and sustains and grows His children by His Word, why would we ever want less? We don't want less food for our bodies. We don't want less money in our bank accounts. Why would we ever want less grace in our souls? So in corporate worship, we see grace in God's saving promises. And secondly, that grace comes by scriptural worship. It comes by scriptural worship. And what's clear in this account throughout is that Israel is being so careful to worship according to the word of God. You see it emphatically under verse 2, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Or verse 4, by number according to the rule, God requires his worship and so God's people are responding even though they're afraid. God, of course, determines how we worship. Who is the one who determines what worship is? The one being worshipped. And he determines it. And he must regulate or rule our worship by how we come to him in the Lord Jesus Christ, or we would never get there rightly on ourselves. The rationale behind God dictating worship is very, very simple. If we were determined worship, it would be by our design, and it would therefore be a false god. 
Or as John Calvin said so rightly, when we are left at liberty, all we're able to do is go astray. That's all we do is leave the path. And so we see here in verse 4 that in the 15th day of Tishri, you have the Feast of Booths. Now, this is where God's people are living for a week for seven days in tents to remind them of the wilderness journey of the first generation that came out of Egypt under slavery and into the promised land. This is, as it were, the Feast of Booths is, is wilderness reminder week. It's camping time. I hate camping. We've spent thousands of years trying to make the indoors this comfortable, and we're going to take our disposable time and income and go leave it. doesn't make any sense. And that's the point. That was the point God is making for his people, that your life is just camping. Now think about this. They're back in the land. They've been singing songs about this land in Babylon, and they became Persia. They've been singing songs. And God says, when you get back in the land, remember, you're just camping. That your whole life is a life of pilgrimage. Your whole life, Israel, you're never to forget. Even though you're in the land, you have not arrived. You are not there until Eden returns and the fulfillment of all of God's promises come to pass. And even though they've begun and God's faithfulness is so evident, God continually reminds his people, until you are eternally dwelling with me in a new heavens and a new earth, you are just camping. You're in the wilderness. And so they continued in the Feast of Booths. They're camping. They're sojourners. And they continued with the most basic offerings of God's people in his sacrifices, and they're offered both, verse 3, morning and evening. Now, God prescribed morning and evening sacrifices. And this applied daily under the Old Covenant. They were doubled on the Sabbath. And we have hints of this same pattern in the book of Psalms, like Psalm 92, verses 1 and 2, we read this. A song for the Sabbath. It's good to give thanks to the Lord to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. And as we see here in Ezra 3, verse 3, this continues after the exile. And this will continue in Judaism, even as the synagogues develop in Israel, there would have been two services every Sabbath, morning and evening. Our Lord Jesus grew up going to evening worship on the Sabbath in the synagogue, to hear God's Word. And you see the same pattern being perpetuated by the apostles in the early church in the book of Acts. The pattern of morning and evening is kept. Uh, Christ's disciples are twice together in the evening when Christ appears to them. Luke 24 and John 20. In Acts 2.42, you see that indicated by the reference to the prayers. We see the early church devoted themselves to the prayers. What are the prayers? They're the assumed pattern of prayer that God's people were familiar with going back centuries. That is morning and evening worship and prayer. Peter and John in Acts 3 go up at the hour of prayer. And then we have infamously, in some ways, at least for Eutychus, in Acts 20, verse 7, Paul the Apostle preaches till midnight in an evening service. Don't worry, we've shortened evening worship. Or even when the Apostle says in his epistles, pray constantly. Or when he tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.3, I remember you constantly in my prayers morning, or excuse me, night and day. The apostle is assuming a pattern of worship in morning and evening set for the people of God. And we rejoice, obviously, the old covenant has been fulfilled in Christ and has passed away wonderfully, especially the sacrifices that have been fulfilled once for all in Christ. But the spiritual positive components of God's worship have not And as the Sabbath was transformed into the Lord's Day by Christ's resurrection on the first day, the ritual sacrifice ended. But the morning-evening principle has continuity. We still come to God by faith in His promise, just as Israel did. But instead of God's promise being prefigured by a slain animal on an altar, God's promise is now being pronounced as accomplished and as finished by Scripture, and it's morning and evening. The truth of the matter is there is more biblical warrant for evening worship than there are for small groups. But contemporary Christianity has become convinced of the latter and is frankly often hostile 
to the former. Now, of course, you don't have to choose. We have both. Wonderfully. But the busyness line in general is a lack of perspective amongst Christians today. Do you realize you and I have more free time than most of human history preceding us? Most people actually worked six days straight just to stay alive. And we think about, I can't believe God wants more of my weekend. Beloved, we don't have a calendar problem, we have a priority problem. We don't prioritize our souls. And far too often, the outcome is a life of fear because I have no security outside myself. God's people in this generation, we read here in Ezra 3, stood against fears, real fears, ancient fears. Where did such courage and faith come? From worship, from the means of God's grace to them, morning and evening. Scriptural worship is not just about giving what God requires. It's about receiving what the Father is pleased to give us. Grace in His Son and by His Word. What fired the motivation of our Baptist forebearers was this great concern. The purity of the church and her worship for the good of souls. And in it, they sought to recover biblical worship from its corruption not just in Roman Catholicism, but in other Christian traditions that we are convinced have not yet more perfectly aligned with Scripture. And typically, in early Baptists, the Lord's Supper was observed in the evening. Why? Well, because that's when Jesus gave it to his disciples, in the evening. And we take everything from the pattern of Scripture. Her, our brother Hercules Collins, in fact, criticized the Church of England for dispensing the Lord's Supper at high noon. When Christ, he says, administered that ordinance in the evening. Now, I'm not sure our brothers are on completely firm ground that I would pound the pulpit on this point. However, the seriousness that they gave to the scriptural pattern, the zeal they had for the importance of worship in the church, and to do everything as we see here according to the rule I don't think should be scoffed at. And to be frank, I really don't think we're in a great spiritual or moral position to look down our noses at it. We need grace. And according to the Word of God, Christ offers it to us here. Why would we not zealously prioritize the worship of God in Christ morning and evening, coming to us by His Word, as we pray it and read it and hear it and as it's preached and as Christ shows it to us at the elements of this table. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank You that we have not gathered for a pseudo-event. We have gathered for reality. A reality as You define it and as You've revealed it in Your Word. We praise You for the grace of worship, that you have brought us together this evening, not just because it is right, and it is, and you ought to be worshipped, you are worthy of more perfect worship than we can offer now, and that we anticipate offering perfectly forever when your purposes are done for us, but also you gather us to worship that we might receive grace and mercy and strength that we'd have courage for our lives and our jobs and our families and every trial that was bothering us right before the service began. Father, we bless you for your love to us. You are a good and perfect Father. We pray you would strengthen us as you promise. And may we run to you in worship with all our fears and find security and access and confidence in you. We ask this, our great God, in Jesus' name, amen.